Welcome. This is a November 12th Jalen Zones production user call. We have Dave, Chris, Igor, Jan, Jamie, Matthias, Antranig, and myself, Michael. Very briefly, the FreeBSD Fall Summit was great. Uh, the video should be up. Uh, Ian's talk was a very pleasant surprise on uh, wireless ISP networking, and that's the first one. So if you go look up the Fall 2024 Summit, that should be easy to find. Um, moving on, <clears throat> Chris is reaching out to folks like you, myself, the Enterprise Working Group, about uh, having a desktop working group to support perhaps in parallel to the laptop efforts at the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, Chris, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, I think everyone knows where to find Chris M. And Igor, it sounds like you are working on jail metadata tagging. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about that? Yeah, hello. <clears throat> Welcome. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, uh, just a short bio, I'm working sure. with FreeBSD like for 20 years. And recent year and two, uh, I'm digging into more details like kernel, hacking, and so on. And uh, currently, uh, I have several projects, and one of them is uh, jail metadata. Uh, the general idea is to have some uh, space in the kernel uh, where we could store some text per jail. So it could be used uh, like uh, tagging jails for accounting, billing anything you can imagine uh, uh and uh, yeah this is a general idea <clears throat> uh, i think this is a very early stage for now uh but soon we plan to get uh, some working patch for review um yeah i guess this is it would that be a bit like zfs user properties where you just say hey here's my arbitrary bit of information yeah, uh, as an analogy, yeah, it could be used. Okay, and what would the restrictions be? Would it be a certain number of characters? Would it be <laughs> number of lines? Well, could you have a poo emoji, the famous idea for an interface name, etc.? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for now, it's just zero-based blob of anything you can push with your client, uh, for example, with jail uh, command in the base. And uh, the initial idea is to limit it to something like 4K. It's allocated on demand. And in the future, it could be improved. This uh, limitation could be uh, tweakable per jail. Like, for example, children max uh, property we have. So it could be propagated down to other sub jails. Um, yeah. How can this group help you at this point? You've all been volunteer uh, testers. Okay, go, go. Do you have <laughs> a review in, in, of any form or are you still just hacking away on it? Uh, uh, right now I'm working on the working patch and oh. I think uh, this, uh, by, by the end of this week or next, on the next week, uh, we could publish it for review on the fabricator. Great, that's how you do it, uh, to have a review. In a week or two. Oh no, you committed to something. <laughs> cool, great. <laughs> um, let's see. Jan, you are verbose. I will kick you down here. Any questions for Igor while we uh, all segue here? <clears throat> so, Antranig, you have just explored the limits of having a single button mouse. How has that treated you? You are okay, so <laughs> yes, now I am back. Am I back? You're back. I'm at. I'm Welcome. actually game. I'm actually gaming on FreeBSD right now on the Linux simulator. Linux simulator. The Linux emulation layer. Good. Let's make it technical. Uh, over Proton on Steam, a Windows game. So it's an MMORPG, and it's working fine. I mean, I I don't have much complaint. Um, okay, so. Uh, in my house, we had a lot of MacBooks, old MacBooks. By old, I mean like 2000, from 8, 11 to 15. These were the ones who had the famous uh, Thunderbolt ports, Thunder, Thunderbolt, Thunder, yeah, Thunderbolt ports before they were Type C connectors. So, you know, most people don't even know what these things are. But 
um, uh, it, it's very viable as a desktop at the moment, thanks to Wi-Fi box, we, which we started discussing about last week for those who were in the Beehive call. Uh, Michael, you were in the um, uh, call summit back then. And uh, Wi-Fi box works fine, perfectly, no issues. I for, for an actual desktop experience, I actually installed Ghost BSD. So I wanted to see the whole process from beginning to end. Now, the GP, it's not using the GPU at all. Uh, it's using the um, SCFB driver, the Syscon's frame buffer driver for the uh, what's its name for the for the um, display itself. But it's working fine in YouTube gaming, whatever it is. Um, uh, and also the Wi-Fi part works fine, like I said. But that's on the desktop part. On the laptop as a server, however, I think we have a major market that we are not tapping into. Those laptops are cheap and almost everyone has them at this point. I mean, just go to your local Starbucks and see web developers running old MacBooks if you want. But this thing is very interesting. This is a Gigabit uh, Thunderbolt 3 adapter. And... Hi, Daniel. Uh, this, is a, this is a Gigabit Thunderbolt 3 adapter that you can connect to your MacBook. Historically, this did not work with FreeBSD at all. But with the latest version, I tried Ghost PSD, so it means it's on 14.1. Uh, they run on stable, by the way, instead of release for faster update reasons. Uh, the BGE driver is working amazingly well without any issues. Uh, historically, I used the, the AGX driver, which was the 100 megabit over USB. That was terrible. I mean, you could not use this laptop as a AGX, ABX, GX, I'll, I'll, AXE, sorry, AXE, yes, AXE. The old one, the USB one was the AXE, yes. Uh, so, but with this one, is working amazingly well. And um, as in PCIe, uh, Jan is asking real Thunderbolt as in PCIe over Thunderbolt or USB 3. I don't know, Jan. What I can say is I connected it to my home network. I configured VLANs on it. I did a speed test and it was working fine as a server. I mean, you know, I could run jails, pass BGS the VLANs. BG is a pure uh, PCIe driver. So um, my assumption is that if it's plugged in at root, um, FreeBSD will just take what is there. It's already enumerated, so mm -hmm. it will find it and then it works. I think the real problem is hot plugging and unplugging. Uh, unplugging for a Wi-Fi driver may uh, for a, what an Ethernet driver may even not crash the kernel, at least not often. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, hot plugging is going to be problematic. Okay, I mean you may I, be I, able I, I to. Did, I... Oops, I did something. unplug and plug, by the way. Like I did plug it, unplug it. Not sure about during boot, but like overall during the day, I would like plug, go to, yes, that guy, exactly that Andrew guy. Yes. Nick, Andrew Nick, speaking about unplugging and plugging, did you unplug the power? Did you check the battery lifetime? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> uh, it's okay for an hour. This is a, like this has been used by people in my team for since twenty. I want to say twenty sixteen. It came out in 2015, we got in 2016, and we've been using it. So, um, and all for ABSD, it's fine. I mean, it's uh, for like, I could easily give this laptop to my mom to do, her, to do her daily browsing and paying taxes, you know? So, and Ghost BSD installation was smooth. Like, it booted, it tried to use the AMD GPU because it was a smart, then it's like, oh, I failed. And then it popped up a, a dialog box, similar to our installer. I selected the FS, uh, SCFB, uh, Syscon's frame buffer, and it opened up the graphical interface. And after that, it was basically like Windows Vista, you know, just click on buttons, install, reboot, done. And more importantly, the UEFI also worked fine, as in, because uh, Macs have their own UEFI thingy, you know? You oh, it'll sleep? The, it'll what? It'll sleep, you're saying? Are you AFI in what regard? The booting or can you use it? the booting process? For example, if you install Windows okay. manually, you might have problems with the booting. You need to mount the um, the MS DOS FS, right? Or what do normal people call it? The FAT32 partition and put some, um, you know, 32 bit um, or 64 bit rather, sorry, uh, binaries in there. But with Ghost BSD, it just worked fine. It put the appropriate binaries and it rebooted. And I also tried it with the other MacBook because I have multiple of these with REFI ND. The you know or refined the refined yep. EFI refined. bootloader. Yep. It also worked fine. It detected Ghost BSD with the Ghost BSD logo, 
with a free BSD logo, sorry. It detected Go with BSD and it also detected um, Windows because I also installed Windows to see if that's working fine or not. So, I mean, the free BSD desktop experience on these Macs is like, it's, it feels like a real Unix workstation. That's all I want to say. Now I'm running Jailer on it. I'm running, you know, other things. Unfortunately, Zoom did not work because uh -huh. Zoom. So I'll, I'll figure that out next week. Uh, oh, so it's a server. It's a laptop. I'm very confused. Here. One of each. I, I now I have. Sure. I have. I have now one of each. Yes. Does it suspend and resume? I have not tried that. I'm sorry. I do not no believe in suspend and resume. <laughs> there are times it doesn't believe in it either. Otherwise, exactly. No, otherwise. That's oh, right. Ahem, yes. Cough. Cough. Yes. Um, anyway, questions for Antrenig. Um, I'm trying to find my 2012 here that I need to wipe and repurpose, and you've got me a reason to repurpose it. Maybe I can do that on the call here. Oh, there it is. Okay, anyway. I checked. The, the driver for this goes back all the way to 2011, and the 2016 ones, they changed it to the USB Type-C connector. Yeah. Uh, but um, but if anyone has, I mean, no, it, I do have one, but I don't have a MacBook from that era because the keyboard sucked. Remember the stupid the butterfly butterfly keyboards? Yeah, exactly. I thought those were all butterfly at 2015 and friends, but no, oh, no, no. Okay. 2015 was the last good one. Yeah. Oh, okay. 2016 was then you <clears throat> with the lemming bar or no? Yes, with the, the smarty uh, bar touch thing? bar. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Touch bar. That, that was 2016 and forward, yeah. Okay, so those are your two updates. Uh, cool. Um, that said, welcome, Philip. Do you have any topics to address? We're punching through a bunch. We might get to some hacking. Uh, no, I'm think, back um, to playing Star Wars. Bye-bye. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think for today, I'm just listening in because I hadn't uh, been on a whole lot. So I'm just kind of catching up on everything. Thanks. No worries at all. Daniel, welcome. Are you doing something cool in New York and can't talk? Oh, just uh, watching a circuit guy work on the circuit, um, which, you know, and the network is full of jail. So that's relevant, right? Sweet. Uh, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, nothing, nothing new and exciting. I was, uh, I was going to try to, um, do some more package-based stuff. I saw uh, Jan had some interesting approaches that I want to that I want to try out. Um, yeah, but nothing new over here. Okay. Uh, does anyone recall Ed Mass team discussing putting package-based support in the in BSD install? No, but that would seem sensible. I guess first we have to get package base in a release before we can add it to the installer. We well, do have it in heck, yeah, releases <laughs> in 14.0. Exactly. P3. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's there. Do we have all the documentation on, on the on the website? Is it part of the no, we don't. release engineering process or is it still ad hoc? Release engineering. IRC to fix it. It's definitely the Release the engineering has taken up the mantle of saying, yes, this is an official release product. So it's the package repositories are built by the release engineering team or their quant jobs. Um, yes, the operational experience is um, still improving. Um, so far it works. And the real problem is we don't have easy to consume ways to make use of these uh, resources once they have released them. Uh, that means we need first of all code so that it's easy to use via the installer. We probably want code and documentation because just code doesn't help uh, for migrating uh, existing installations because otherwise you will anyone wanting to commit to it is still stuck with their old systems unless they're prepared to abandon and recreate them, which would slow down adoption. And then um, you're left with the annoying fact that someone has to write the documentation. And Well, I've been adding to the wiki. Right now you can only <laughs> document what is possible at the package command line, there isn't a good, uh, easy to use workflow, for example, to install it. The migration 
is about to stay hacky, I think, mm, for a while. And yeah, but crash installation. And the other thing is where it's quite easy uh, to do is to write code for this proper uh, jail support, which is for people using jails. Most of the user lens are jails, not hosts. So all the dangers of locking yourself out during conversion don't apply to a jail if you can uh, access the host. Hmm. So uh, it's a lot safer to migrate jails to package base. Thanks, George. Hmm? What was that? Yeah. Oh, sorry, was I unmuted? Sorry about that. No worries. Welcome, Beach Geek. Do you have any topics to discuss? I like your name. Oh, cool nickname. So Jan, you have sprouted some new features. Uh, oh, yes. About that. Do you go by any any other names? Uh, actually, I use this for open source, so it doesn't tie back to my business. Okay, no worries. Hey, uh, you are welcome to drop uh, topics in the doc or chat, and uh, if you just want to be on a fly on the wall, that's just fine. Stay okay, thank you. Wall. Of course. Uh, Jan, you gave me an inspiring call late one night about your executable jail.com progress. What do you have to share, if anything? Sounds like you have a milestone. So, um, what I have done is yeah. I started cleaning up my existing prototype, uh, rewriting stuff, and found that with this approach, the reuse was hampered by um, just having to collect too many symbols into the wrong uh, right places so that you kind of had to know all the implementation details and it wasn't really that helpful. Then I paused, thought about it and noticed that, yeah, that's very similar to how our CDT scripts are. So you don't want to symbolink them into some magic order or something instead you have you use a command to sort them and we have that command in base it's called rc order so now i have a executable jailconf helper which searches for directories inside a directory so it looks in there if it finds anything that sorts it with rc order and then uh, outputs uh, rc order without an underscore and so it takes all the the sim links to uh, reuse jail.conf snippets, maps them to their real name, uses sort dash u to deduplicate, and then ask the order to sort uh, into a semantic order, and then emits the correct order of includes, so that you can override default values. Um, but still provide default values when you need them, just for it to be semantically valid if you don't want to overwrite them. And yeah, that works. Then I um, did the same for um, the exec dot uh, whatever hooks and um, took advantage of the fact that RC order has support for keywords. So now, it will find anything inside the jail directory which ends in .sh and use RC order for each of the stages in uh, jail.com. So prepare, pre exec, uh, sorry, pre start, created, start, uh, post start, pre stop, stop, um, post stop, release. Each of the hooks you have, you can opt into by declaring that keyword and then it runs them in that order. You. These guys. And these are just, if you look for keyword colon in there. Uh, okay, it's without. So you have a shell comment and you say keyword colon and then a list of keywords. Hmm. And then you have a, a script with something like keyword colon uh, prepare, and it gets run in the prepare state. And 
the before and require um, lines decide its position among the same step. Cool. Uh, of ACDT scripts, and by doing it like that, you can just zoom link to a directory of other scripts uh, or config snippets. Uh, if you if more than one of your zoom link in directories references the same file for zoom link, it gets deduplicated, so not a problem. And I can still keep jail startup time on a small low power systems to less to about half a second or so. Um, then I implemented helpers to do things like dynamically allocate a a DevFS rule set number so that I can have a jail which specifies its DevFS rule set, um, but not have to write it to the global ETC DevFS rules and preload those that just the jail specifies which devices it. This is important to me because it's a, a requirement to, for Beehive uh, jails because this is supposed to have only access to the Beehive devices for the guests supposed to run in it and not yeah, it's all, all of them. Mm. And yeah, <clears throat> by doing it like that, it works. <clears throat> as in uh, and I can now have the root set in my jail configuration that says, okay, these are the devices I want to expose. Cool. Uh, Jamie, any questions for Jan, or you'll just keep following along as he uh, well, hacks away at this? I think I, I have a lot of icons. Look at the top of his. <laughs> There's a lot there. Yeah, it's uh... sorry. I have to understand. Oh yeah. Oh no worries. And he's just fleshing it out and always discovering something at every turn. And I'm glad you stuck with it, Jan. I admire that. Well, keep us posted. It sounds like you've still got more to hack and yak away with. Uh, well, Matthias, it sounds like you've found RC order useful. Yeah, pretty much for the same uh, same reasons, but different use case to to compute the using the provides and uh, requires uh, compute. Uh, with the order in which to build uh, OCI uh, container images, and it works uh, beautifully. I I f I was feeling very guilty for uh, hijacking it in that way, but now I no guilt. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> now yeah, okay. again, makes me feel better. Has anyone else seen uses of it uh, other than the canonical RC use? Because Gee, I mean, as a as a vendor, it. it's mm -hmm. as a vendor, it's useful. So we know what to strip out. You know, it's like okay, let's run RC order and see what is the system booting or what in what order would it boot. So we can put the required, you know, in in the right place and order. So it's it's. I mean, yeah, it's a very useful thing to have overall. Cool. The only frustration with you, uh, order it tells you one at a time, Dave. The only thing with RC order is it tells you what order things are going to be um, started in. It doesn't give you reliable dependencies. So oh, no. if you need service foo absolutely be running and accepting packets on the network or having made its Unix socket, um, it doesn't do that. And that's really frustrating. And I think this is one area where system D really is just a lot further ahead. And a lot of other things which even predate systemd, but um, that's the thing. RC order only gives you an ordering, uh, or yeah. not. It does not uh, satisfy requirements. It only does. Okay, if you launch it in that order and everything is behaving correctly, it should come up without errors. It does not mean that. As soon as some requirement is satisfied, but no earlier, something is started. Or that something is restarted or something. Nope. The so ordering, Whereas, no more, no less. Yes. Mm, okay. It's basically sorting the rc.d scripts, not dependency tracking them. Right. Well, <laughs> it does what it says on the tin, eh? Uh, is, uh, do we, what resources do we have? 
currently beyond third party tools to handle some of that dependency tracking? Are they just blunt instruments and tests and scripts? I guess I'll go with Dave's frustrating. Um, Jan, is S6RC the promised land for that uh, dependency tracking? If you write clean services, it is part, it is within it is within the promised land. Let's say that yeah, there there are other correct solutions too, but mm. S six RC is one of them. Oh, so within S six RC uh, services specify their requirements, and the service manager will start services as soon as they are requirements are met and it knows the difference between I've started the service and the service has reported readiness. Uh, readiness is indicated through a very simple S6RC specific protocol where it tells you in an environment variable uh, the file descriptor number of the notification file descriptor and you're supposed to write a single byte to that by convention a new line and close the pipe. Hmm. Closing yeah. and the specific byte are optional, but you have to write one byte and then you're considered ready. So it's ridiculously simple to implement for an application if you want. It's one get end and to look, get the number, and then it's basically write this one byte buffer to that pipe. Uh, know the results, it won't fail. It's a pipe. With, it's your supervisor, you're not. It's, supposed to supervise it. Okay. So um, it's very simple to implement. And if your daemon uh, does not directly support it, there are ways to do it anyway. You can either write your own little script yep. to, to, or you can um, make use of a helper to do active polling until the service is ready. And right. you can con Figure it to specify basically the minimum startup delay you always want to rate, and then the number um, of attempts you want to make polling and the interval between the attempts. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, it's not perfect in that case because you have to do polling, and yeah, if okay. the application doesn't help you, but you can easily do it. It's cool. really run this helper script. As a wrapper, it's similar to sudo. It, board, because we can all and... kind of hmm? So it requires discipline not to type over somebody else's or edit somebody else's stuff. No, it's just discipline. Basically, everyone has to make sure that every service you want to depend on has to be written in such a way that it does not clobber its own readiness. Service manager does the right thing. You don't have to worry about some other service messing with the readiness notifications accidentally, you would have to intentionally uh, as root do um, stupid things, which are not easy to do wrong by accident. Beach Geek, have you done any service uh, supervision? Uh, not much. Uh, I'm still. Uh getting caught up on the jails right now okay uh did let me know if you want to do an intro or anything otherwise no worries no pressure any other jail topics before we get to something i have published which is a a little to-do list that's been growing over the last few years would you like to take a look at that <clears throat> yes we would yes you would okay so yeah we've been the public record will show that we've been talking a lot about a lot of topics. Let me zoom in on this. Uh, I do not want to use Google Docs, and it was kind of horrifying that for a live interactive summit, when you do a a presentation, it, you can't live edit it. You have to like reload it, which makes sense such that you don't have malicious things from the team put on screen, but also there are times you actually want to have bullet points. So if you can think of a tool that like the summit recordings doesn't have like say a pdf with navigation floaters that's on the list anyway so i'm a little miffed by that but here we are this is a tool we have on Trinity. keep me posted on LibreOffice and uh call out bora office and only office etc so 
Uh, last year, we had a scratch pad with ideas that largely became a, a set of notes and t-shirt ideas. And I think we're up to 35 snarky, snarky as hell t-shirt ideas. Let's see. Yeah. So you are welcome to peruse that. I'll put that in the doc. Uh, HackMD.io, can I self-host it? Or HedgeDoc? Oh, it would be high. Hedge... <laughs> it would be high. So yes, enjoy. Oh, so there we go. Um, one, there's the absolute broad notion that we all have amazing notes on that topic. Ooh, let me go find a link for that. Uh, CFT.LV, which will get us to an article. Uh, do, 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 ooh, that was easy to find. Just one moment. It'll set a little context here, which is clicky, clicky. Uh, stop blogging and start documenting. It's an article, my last article on call for testing, possibly literally the last in so far as uh, we all have these amazing notes and we throw them up on like the Fediverse and then they never, ever, ever, ever hit documentation where they really need to be. So let's all just try to get in the habit of punching things in there. So for example, on the package based wiki page for FreeBSD, I noticed that there's nothing mentioned about how to actually build a base package. So I added a little you know, naive thing about that based on what I could find, and it seems to work. So, uh, uh, context. So, stop logging and start documenting. So, there's that. That's just my opinion, but that's also based on decades of pounding my head against this. So, that said, um, at on stage at uh, EuroBSD Con, I I uh, proposed something that formed through a number of discussions with people like Maximiliano Stucchi and uh, Peter Henstein of BSD training, not to be confused with BSD tutorials. Antrenig, you and I, and Sergei, was it, had a great chat about what does a curriculum for, say, a not quite fanciest country in the world uh, look like that people can have, have say Raspberry Pi 400s let me reach behind me which was remarkably inches from the Thunderbolt adapter and how do you take something like this oops take a device like that have something like a bare minimum Unix system possibly with like Occam BSD and have a courseware in various languages to go with it and the model would not be like a new monopoly it would be completely BSD licensed with available information translated to your uh, language of choice, just give credit where credit is due. I think that's something that the, the conferences could also benefit from having some notion of more formal training rather than a random tutorial. The tutorials have received some flack for running their course, but some have been amazingly well attended, some not so much. So anyway, there's some ideas on uh, documentation. We just got an update from Jan on some of his composable jail work. Uh, related to that, he has spoken at length about Beehive process supervision over the years and had one of his trademark epiphanies, which is that, well, if we're all pitching UCL, uh, what if the only mother could love SXRC syntax had a UCL front end? So I am quite interested in that because you could sprinkle it over an existing system as you wish, rather than completely move to it and suffer the fate of say open RC where it's like, let's rewrite every R script, RC script, especially in ports and God help us anyway. Uh, jump in if you have any comments on these little context points. But going a little deeper, I really don't know what uh, user-friendly systems administration and deployment would look like without just having some kind of web-based GUI tool on like Windows, Mac, and whatever with a web browser. You describe the system you want, and then you push it to, say, hypervisors. You push it to immunes. We had a great immunes introduction, I believe, last week. Um, there is GVN3 or something that's another similar thing that lets you map out a network and just uh, uh, push, say, hey, I want a router us machine over here. It spins one up for you. So that's all quite exciting. And that gets into, say, uh, crossing the divide and pushing to bare metal. There are various ways of doing that, things like storage description languages and all that. I'll get to the... Uh, meat of it here. So to the point, uh, leaving the Open ZFS Summit, I could sure use some get blame help if someone has some favorite syntax for the most rudimentary analytics. Great. 
Um, Entrenig, you and I started banging out a a proof of concept, or at least the I had the front end. Maybe you've got the back end for BSD install, giving say ZPool compatibility options when you're setting up a system because people get burned right, left, and center by saying, "Oh, here's our one fourteen system among 13s and suddenly, gee, its pool can't be imported on anything else. However, there's there, there are no features we actually want in that newer level. There's a nice sort of shorthand syntax for pool compatibility. Uh, and folks like Rod have really been burned trying to do pop, Proxmox plus FreeBSD plus plus plus. And uh, I think we want the world, there's a message from the summit, we want the world to be familiar with those compatibility levels and say, hey, here's something we agree to because, hey, ZFS is a portable file system and volume manager. What a concept. <clears throat> um, oh, I would like to look at package base and the VM images such that when they get shipped from release engineering, they, in fact, have package base. That's one, one of my little battles. We talked earlier a second ago about package support in BSD install. I thought I heard Edmast has someone working on that, possibly BAPT. I don't know, but uh, that, in theory, is being worked on. Uh, Antrenig, you, Levi, and I discovered that, wow, the VM Beehive has... Uh, VM migration code. Great. Awesome. It's not in the package. Is it? Is that because it just never got pushed? Is that because it's broken? We don't know. Let's take a look at that. That's... It's in the package. It's just not documented in the package. Uh, oh, so he did the the help. It's not in the help. Uh, he, yep. he very good. Yep. Not, big the code here. is implemented, but it's not in the manual nor in the package help. Uh, sorry, the VM help yeah, or VM help. Users, Yeah. You know? Oh, great. Yeah, so documentation. That's why I led with documentation. So, and, and these are things that anyone could do. Um, updating a manual page is a whole lot of copy and paste of the formatting and then um, just preview it. Go ahead, Jan. Have you considered that there's a reason he hasn't documented that feature yet as at all, even in the usage and help, because it's not finished or tested? That was my question, but it's there. My first thought is that it's it never made it from repo to package, but it did make it to package, which in indicates that it's hopefully a little more along than expected. So uh, actually, here is my 14.2 beta 2 image. I hope to have two B-links set up to experiment with. If you want to spin something up, please, please, please go for it. Moving on, my problem, not yours, RAID Z, and imagine I use VM images, gee, a bit like ones that could be package base. Uh, I love that, and I haven't had a chance to work on that for weeks and months because I've been doing conferences, ignore all that. So um, a topic from the FreeBSD Summit. Gee, FreeBSD doesn't have a notion of MPLS. Do you spin up an OpenBSD VM? Uh, I think, Jan, you pointed out. Uh, what did you point out? You had a comment. What was your comment on MPLS? It's That uh, it's, that's, it's something that you should not be using anymore. What day and age yeah. of this. The question is, why do you still need MPLS? Uh, but if you do, um, or if you have to interface with a big deployment, it's not going away on existing installations. Okay. Um, one of its advantages over supposedly more modern ways is that it does not require fancy hardware support to make it perform and has a lot less on-wire overhead than something like the XLAN where you have an additional Ethernet header and an additional UDP and IP header and you are suddenly up to 100 bytes more, so uh, MTU than VNR1, and of, which means that you now need bigger um, NICs everywhere with uh, something like MPLS has that little overhead on the wire okay. that unless you have hardware which is truly incapable of exceeding 1500 bytes even something like a handful of bytes is often enough because you need basically just another ethernet header and four bytes per level of mpls nesting okay uh, yeah are and there any votes here on the call for mpls make or it that fast is historic your software but 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 uh, the question, the problem is that it does not play nice unless you're directly on the Ethernet layer. Okay. Um, because it is an alternative to IP on the Ethernet layer. 
So you can't just run it over some um, annoyingly locked down network or something. So yeah. And it is its complete alternative reality with its own routing protocols uh, and debugging tools and so on. So yeah. Uh, there's a it's easy to have some okay, we can push and pop uh, or replace MPLS uh, labels. Great. Uh, now you need the rest. Yes. Are there any votes here for MPLS or that was a great thing at the time? Have a nice day. Uh, it's is the, is the nat of the ISP level, you know? It's like, hey, we don't know how to do this right, so here's a temporary solution, and that temporary solution ends up being very permanent uh, because some people just don't want to move on. Okay. Uh, so it's 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 as someone who has done MPLS for a large gold mine, it's it was a terrible terrible idea. Basically, it, it's it's not. I don't want to even remember. Uh, did you and, keep and any of the gold? Of... Go ahead. Uh, just a question. Uh, if it's something that uh, that can uh, um, make it uh, an easier decision for ISPs to to switch to FreeBSD, would it make sense to to support it? And you know, maybe then they can switch to something better. Uh, once they're on FreeBSD, because they have their I, solutions. I, 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 I do have a comment for that. So here's here, and because I have talked with ISPs, because one of the largest ISPs in Armenia uses FreeBSD for everything, from DNS servers to routing and everything. But uh, they have a lot of junipers with MPLS here and there as well. And yep. when I talk with them, I'm like, do you care if there is MPLS support in FreeBSD? And his response was, if the time comes that I need to switch that box, to a new system such as FreeBSD, it means that it has the time come to use a new technology instead of MPLS. It's like, hey, I'm doing the migration anyway on that area. Let me just not use an, uh, you know, a temporary solution that was passed on by me by Cisco Designs. So uh, I have talked with ISPs about this. Um, so yeah, that's, 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 that was their cool. response. And uh, not another word about that, uh, I believe it was the first talk from the summit the other day. Check it out. Ian's talk on wireless ISPs was very inspiring insofar as like he's, oh, here's this ARM-based system with uh, B uh, BM BMC management. And here is how he paid Clara to add the uh, 3G modem support driver, et cetera, which wasn't too difficult. And wow, PPP is super reliable. And it was, it's oh. a great talk. Check it out. And he's balancing failover between fiber, cellular, and Starlink. Yes, Jan. But something like a wireless ISP would be a valid use case, in my opinion, to this day for MPLS because. Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> you can, um, you have packet rates you are likely to handle in software on low power budget hardware. And there yep. the advantage of just replacing a fixed size label, you look up in an array instead of doing a prefix match may still be relevant, but you can also get a faster CPU and do it with pure IP. Okay. Well, related. Ca things can be argued in my opinion. It's not, I'm not as against MPLS as Antonik has been burned by it, <laughs> apparently. Fair enough. As for and Real there are horrible MPLS implementations out there. Ah. And even worse deployments because people just keep on basically adding more complexity to centralized control planes uh, for things like traffic engineering to instead of removing bottlenecks, they tend to manage them. Hmm. Okay. If you then to say, no, we don't have to upgrade. We can instead where that traffic slightly more suboptimal and then charge someone if they want the faster link. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's basically well. uh, managing um, often artificial uh, scarcity instead of uh, just improving your network. Got it. Okay. Well, that said, 
uh, MPLS. Uh, he, he also had some great comments on how to absolutely reliably re eliminate congestion using dummy net and PF and other nifty stuff. So he will be upstreaming a bunch of that ASAP, which is great. So in addition to showing neat hardware, in addition to showing uh, cellular drivers, um, it was, uh, you'll, you'll hear my recorded question, which is like, okay, so are you using bird instead of FFR out of muscle memory? And you're like, well, they're, they're doing so little that FRR with free range routing was way too big. Fair enough. Which, uh, led me to wonder, is there a simple little next step in basic routing that FreeBSD's routing is missing that would eliminate the need for a third party package like bird or FRR? That's not one I can answer. And Rod's not here to shame, share some opinions, but I think he might be opinionated given his role. So I'll leave that as just a point of, to, of discussion. Oh, gee, I don't want to use Google Docs. I don't want to put people's last names in it. Antoneg, let me know if you've got anything nifty there. Uh, for these calls, as we've been discussing, <laughs> stop Did I miss yakking some, more uh, hacking. Product? Yes. Or was that an uh, intentional um, pun? Which is that? Oh, back, back orifice. orifice. <laughs> oh, who's old enough to remember back orifice from like the nineties? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, quite intentional. Go. That was an, an Easter egg. <laughs> I'm glad you. Okay. Found it. What about Ninda? Uh, was that what about Ninda? Cult of the Dead one. Cow or something? Yeah. What was the other one, Dave? Yeah, okay. So it really Ninda. was a joke. Okay. It was, it a was joke. the first big Windows worm, and I was the on-duty engineer. Know. At a at a very large Microsoft partner that we oh, goodness okay, take yeah. care, Chris. Oh goodness, okay. Well, anyway, uh, did you say Ninja? What was the one? Babe? Nimda. I, Ninda. Ninda. Oh, that N I N D A. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Dave, Dave, are you talking about a nightmare that you had, or is this like historically uh, accurate? Hey, you weren't it's born. Historically accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. It was 2001. Oh my. Okay. Yeah, yeah, those were good, bad times. And I recall back office being a suite of tools that you could just slice through a window, like what, NT server at the time? Ugh, anyway. Yeah, more like, yeah, in NT4, early 2000 Windows or C O T C Windows 98, SC2. The dead cow. Like okay. Um, moving on, Antonig, if you're still here, I saw I'll be right back. Are you away? You might be away. Nonetheless, I, am, I am back. Welcome. Did I just noticed again Mark Johnson's comments on your DTrace library re regression of like, wait, did that ever work? <laughs> so the bug is here. It's in the doc. Have a nice day. Maybe that can get fixed. Um, it, did it ever work it, for you? <laughs> yes, we've used it like on daily basis, not daily, fine, on okay. weekly basis in our product. It's actually one of the reasons why our product is still stuck in an older version of FreeBSD at the moment. Then if he uh, left on that question, please say it right there. Hey, yes, we used it successfully up until whatever... That point, <clears throat> yes. Whatever release or whatever exact commit in your uh, bisection when you found the exact moment of it breaking, which I'm guessing <laughs> you haven't had a chance to chase down. No, no, there's a team member on that product team who's looking into it, so I'll wait for their response. Uh, and, uh, working on it actively? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, what what version do you recall it working on? It definitely worked in, on all of 11 and all of 12. No, it worked on all of 11, and we've only been using 12.3. We haven't upgraded to 12.4. 12.3 works? Yes. Got it. Yes. Maybe uh, a stupid question, but could the problem be that some of the system headers are moving to C11 yes. with things like anonymous structs? Yes. And, and uh, because it's, it's unions and stuff like that? No. Uh, the problem is that some of the structs in the, in the, what do you call that? In the struct, ISA, the word ISA. Um, in, in, in instruction set specific parts uh, that we have are being re, um, redefined multiple times in our source tree. So like, say you have a struct wow. named pool is being redefined again, and DTrace doesn't like that. That's the whole thing. It's just being redefined. 
Uh, how could no one notice this? I have no idea. Because as far as I know, the CPP should tell you that you've really... F no, wait, CPP is dumb. Maybe the CPP doesn't tell you that. I'm not uh, sure. Does D-Trace evaluate the if death mazes? Or does it take all the type deaths? It, it actually just calls... It just calls CPP as is, you know? Yes, but what if... Yeah, so maybe they're not giving... The C preprocessor, processor the things it would normally pick up when invo invoked by the compiler so that you invoke it with different uh, arguments, effectively, honestly, or different default macros. Yeah. Honestly, it could be. I'm, 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 I'm a very Pascalian guy, so I wouldn't know. So our C person it's is looking into it. Just forgiving uh, if you invoke as a C compiler, but have some of the places with compilers have things like, yeah, re be really, really relaxed about legacy behavior and system headers. Don't even mm -hmm. warn about it. But he felt because nobody wants to be told that their system headers are a bit dirty for legacy reasons. You yeah. don't appreciate if you turn on the warnings to find bugs in your own code, if you get told yeah. that there are questionable style decisions in system headers, because 99% of the users are not in a position to do anything about that. And if you keep bugging them about it, they will just disable that warning. So uh, it's often better to not tell users about uh, things a compiler can understand, but you really shouldn't do uh, in system headers. So it sounds like you have a few actionable things and uh if anything, showing the fact that it worked on these versions. And if your C person is seeing a way on it, go for it. Hopefully they can come with a response, yes. And by the way, thank you, for, thank you for the document. It's like everything that we've been doing for the last God knows how many years in a single place. You explained my yeah. joke to me. Yes, exactly. I mean, this is so overdue. And it's like, well, let's let's stop yakking and start hacking. So yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so there's a review for PCI Conf LibXO output. Um, anyone doing, say, lower level system stuff um, really likes things like PCI Conf. And here's a fun one. It's like, why is that Nick always like half at speed? Well, it happened to be in like a 4X slot when it, X4 slot when it wanted <laughs> X8. Well, mm -hmm. it's kind of important to know some of the stuff. And that was a whole bunch of time wasted. Oh, some guy. Okay. Hello. I'd like to take a list review. Where are we at? This is seven years old and it's been extended. This needs to be reviewed. Okay, well, okay. So it needs some love. If someone loves that, please give it some love. Uh, funny, Moose FS came up several times recently. And mm -hmm. everyone talks about their scars with, say, Gluster and like, oh, we can set it up. But then if you want to replace a node, well, it's easier to become like an alcoholic or something. So... Uh, has anyone here used Moose FS in happiness or anger? Uh, I have in yes. moderate feelings without any drinking, but not on free BSD. Uh, I have no specific feelings about it. It kind of just worked fine for the That's customer that I was supporting consensus. without any. Yeah, I mean, I, it's 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 kind of like it, the type of community that they have is like, hey, we do one thing and we do it well, kind of mentality that they have. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not yeah. very much known into the deeper parts of it because I I know it can do like amazing things apparently for storage, but yeah, there's uh, a pro version for that. Um, yeah. was it easy to spin up, and would it be easy to just tell people, hey, let us know how far you get, and is it anywhere in the documentation? I couldn't find a single reference to FreeBSD and it other than their page, which has downloads for FreeBSD. Bless their heart. So, so for my is customer, it, it was it was deployed previously. Right, okay. I was not the person who deployed it. Okay. However, the documentation was so well that, like, whatever the customer requested, as someone who had no Moose FS experience, I just got the job done without ever touching it That's before good in to my hear. life. So, yes, that was the good part of it. So you didn't so become that... Linux kernel and release engineer like you so often have to do with all these damn things. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, everything worked. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so so again, is it, it's come up is recently. It something... Go ahead. Yes. Is it something that you add on to ZFS or is yes. it instead of ZFS? Uh, I believe like you it. add on to, yeah. yeah. So the, the two oh, things yes, to be aware of with, with Moose FS is that number one, the clients are fuse based. So it's not a high performance file system. 
it never will be. Um, and number two is that if you want transparent failover, clustering, all of that type of stuff, then that's a paid feature, not a not an in-house one, not, not an open source one. And that's why a lot of people end up going for Ceph because they go, well, I have all the nice shiny things for free. Um, but yeah. Uh, what's what would you say are the top missing features for on the free version? What was it HA? Yeah, the HA stuff. Yeah, the, the clustering. Yeah. Oh, I thought that was kind of its raison d'être. No, that's that's oh. the. So you still have the single point of failure unless you want to pay for the. You still have a. Um, I can't remember what it's called anymore. But like a um, kind of metadata servers. Yeah, you have a metadata server, and that's okay. a single point of failure um, until you until you pay. Uh, what I really see, new. what I see in my notes is that the customer asked me to add uh, another node so they can, you know, have more storage. And uh, basically, you know, a month after I did the work, they needed more storage, so they just ended up buying a massive server and just running pure ZFS on it with FreeNAS. This was four years ago, mm -hmm. so uh, it wasn't FreeBSD, by the way. The initial one with most FS, it was. Linux based. I'm not sure which one though. Uh, but uh, then they moved to like just free NAS because they need a distributed file system for more storage. And they were like, hey, let's remove the distributed file system and just have more storage. <laughs> you know, less, yeah. less, less problems to deal with. Scale so that, that was, out. yeah, exactly. Right. So the, the mm -hmm. big problem with all of these clustered systems is they work fine until they don't. And then Correct. you realize that you really have a major problem. And normal boring servers are so reliable these days that if you really, really need it, you can afford to have a stick and spare system that your developers use. And when it goes custard, you walk over and yank all the cables out of it, plug it into the other one. Yep. Um, the best distributed file system I've used hands down was OpenAFS, um, which has a commercial fork called, what is it called now? Um, Aura Store, I think. Aura Store. Uh, if they change, unless they change their name again. Uh, kind of AFS store. is still a thing. What? Sorry. Still a thing. AFS. And your file system is still a thing. Well, Open AFS or. Yeah. Is it? It sounds like yes. Sort of. Not really. Hmm. Basically, the guys who maintain it said no one's paying us to do it, and they went off and formed Aura Store, which which is really ah. great, um, but paid. Um, but it doesn't have a FreeBSD client. But at the time I was using OpenAFS, it had everything. It had Windows, FreeBSD, Solaris, all the clients. There and we, um, we used it for shoveling. Um, so this is at a University of New Zealand, and um, a lecturer would go um, up to a different um, city where there's like a, 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 a lab by the sea for, for doing um, a research up for like about six months. And we would just send their data like a little ZFS snapshot almost transparently up to the other system over about um, four or five days. And when they got there, all their data would be local again. And when they came back, we just snaffled it down. Um, it was super. It was really, mm. really nice. But time has passed. Was that snaffle? That might be. Snaffle. It's a technical like word. It. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do just wanted to ask, and um, because I never felt the need of having a distributed file system, but is there any modern need for, because historically it was, we need more storage and there are no large size disks, right? But is there a usage for it now, now that you can you know, buy a super micro and have a you know, 5.1.6 petabyte of storage basically on it, you know? The, the, the short answer is yes, it's about, about reducing your failure risk. Reducing your failure risk. Okay. Uh, performance yeah. and uh yeah uptime yeah. I'll, I'll dig some links out there's some really interesting talks for about using open afs at um morgan stanley and um that was run um out at uh um, i think the development work was done in, in budapest near, near hungary but you can imagine a company that needs to distribute um applications to many many different operating systems and they could um, do this with AFS just just like that. Um, mm. Release data to many many nodes instantly, and it's just one of those things. It's once you use it, you realize it makes a whole lot of things easier. But it's very much a niche um, feature that you sort of get trapped in. And nowadays, everyone would use 
um, object storage for this and write their own tooling around it. But um, yeah, if you want to update thousands, like you know, um, 10,000, 30,000 workstations instantly to a new version of applications, that is a very hard problem to solve that AFS does beautifully. Hmm. Okay. I, I just wanted to say, because I, I just learned about these things, like for academic purposes. And I remember like the first one that was released was by CMU, the Carnegie Mellon University. I think it was called CODA. They even have a website for it, coda.cs.cmu.edu. And like this is from 1987, apparently. You know, I don't know if it's still alive or like if it's being used for anything, but maybe it would be interesting from an academic point of view as well. It says good scalability. I don't I have no idea what that means, but that's what the website says. Good scalability, network bandwidth ad adaptation. Uh, security model, server replication, high performance, freely available under a liberal license. What does that mean? Uh, and this, I hope so. Uh, and a lot of you know they have like nine bullet points in there. So uh, I've never used this. I just when I was researching, is like, oh, this was kind of the first viable distributed file system out there by oh, yeah, uh, yeah. released by CMU. So it went from HTTPS to HTTP. But yes, it's out there. Okay, cool, um, lovely. Um, did anyone use Coda? Um, not, not commercially. It never got out of an academic prototype, but nice. Yeah. Open Atheist is the only one of these that actually got used at scale in production, to my knowledge, um, apart from the internal Google stuff, which never gets out. OK, enough on that topic. Uh, Dan, any topics as we blast through all this? No, not on. Cool. Um, wh why is libvdsk forever in limbo? That is the ability for Beehive to just open up a QCAD2 image, etc. And I learned that Open BSD's uh, VMM has VMC I, which will limbo. either mount it, let me finish, will either mount it and boot it or let you convert. And I wonder if there's conversion code we can steal. What was that, Jan? What do you mean it's in limbo? Don't we have a port of that name? It never, I, from what I can tell, it just never hit uh, base. It never hit anywhere. If you, if you can find it being available in base, fantastic. I look forward to it. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, conversion is easy to implement if you're willing to install a package because it's that can be done here with... and now. But OpenBSD yeah. would have some ISC license code that maybe we can rip out for a really tiny tool, perhaps. Just a thought. Just a thought. Because, and I will say, I can never, ever, ever remember the QEMU image syntax. I have to look it up every damn time. It's a weird <laughs> order position of ordered. Uh, things and that's all that like no okay, just give me so is, is the command a sub command and just bunch of flags basically yes just so yeah, yeah. and like the, the endings matter and like oh come on okay anyways that's just my opinion I, and i was i was pleased to have someone point out that open bsd has some in base goodies anyway I, I think there was a reddit war around that sorry the hacker news war around oh, really? that. someone someone put it put in there said I hate that BSD forces you to have the flags first and the arguments last. Oh, geez, and then okay. someone replied and said, have you seen the Cambio system flags? <laughs> exactly. And that's, oh, and my favorite, gee, the, uh, what was it? The, when repacking the ISOs and you use like seven zip on FreeBSD or Linux or something, and there's an actual single letter command is a flag not a flag it x. looks like a flag but it should it's an x, x. and i was like what the what so don't be nice be nice anyway so there's a quick one uh now's not the time to go too deep on this but kind of picking up on that mpls discussion it's like wow we have in 2024 and onward if there is a future we have wireguard we have vxlan we have a bunch of things and a colleague was saying do just do what the data centers do on a smaller scale even if it's a raspberry pi go with like VXLAN and BGP rather than a whole bunch of other things and GRE tunnels. And I'm not a networking guy, so I'll just let y'all hack on that. But um, wait for Ian's talk to be published. That was quite exciting. I like what they're doing. Uh, if someone wants to take charge on that, great. I'd like to move on at the very moment. 
Uh, it sounds like, Antrenig, you've got some news on unprivileged jails from last week's call that I could not attend. What's going on? Um, my team members needed to add that based on a customer request. We actually had a, a bad, bad case because the jails were running as root. Yeah. Uh, it's it's by the way, it's not a technical issue that we had, but rather a Emotional. compliance issue. Oh, okay. I wish mm -hmm. it was. It was a compl because some compliance check check marks are like this thing should not be run as that. Apparently, the right. customer also needed to, to move to from PFSense to OpenSense years ago because of that as well. Because PFSense historically was running the whole PHP application as root, while OpenSense does proper pseudo management. Uh, or whatever, man, or maybe SUID, I don't know. But basically, it's not running as root. It's, it's running as dub, 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 right? So they were like, hey, your jails are running as root. We need to make them run as not root because of compliance issues. You have these many weeks, months, whatever to work on. So okay. my team started working into that. And turns out the hard part is done on the root part. So uh, the rest is apparently not as hard as my team told me. Um, uh, again, above my pay grade i'm not that smart in but programs. we do have jamie present if he hasn't yes disappeared off to his espresso maker or something uh true parts done the true part is it was done by the community not by us uh -oh. we just looked into that part looked into jail part is like okay this is how this should be that that is how that should be basically so there's a team member who's also working on that the same okay. team member who's working on the trace uh will that I, i'd rather talk to this person and swap my notes um and anything we can do to help um, would be great. Okay, Dave has notes. Jamie, I hope you can review. We'll just kind of try to put that on a silver platter for you when the time comes. Um, yeah, it's, I, I get very scared of this particular subject because it's security and yeah. I don't want to do things wrong. <laughs> one of the one of the good things that we did after buying the fat server is that, well, now you can fuzz things. At least the simple things where you print your face is like, yo, bro, you did this very badly. And also one of the customers who happens to also be a security vendor, they gave us a stat, 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 what do they call that? Statistical source code analysis tool. You know, okay. it's like it parses the source code, tells you you're not, like, you know, you're doing double free or like you're kind of stuff. Yeah, or like you're doing double mal, no, you're you're using after free, or you're doing double free, or you did malloc on this size, but you're using it on that size. This is the source code analysis. Um, nothing fancy. That 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 technology has been around for more than two decades now. But it's good to know that some part of our source code goes through that at least. And I agree with Jamie. Even as security engineers, it's scary when you touch the kernel like that. Oh, it's uh, unprivileged, except that moment it is. <laughs> it is <absurd. laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Dave, what form do your notes take? Napkin notes? Uh, they're in the original sheet. Oh, where, nice. where we put that. Okay. Uh, what quarter of the year? I've split those out a few weeks ago, so they're a little more manageable, so it's not like 300 I'm pages. I'm sure it's in months. here. Great. Drop it in the chat, perhaps. Ooh, blocked and files. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I will put our store up there, and of course, that's if someone hasn't put it in the doc already. This is your doc, not mine. Our store, eight point two, want more. Okay, thank you. Bank on where are we at? Do, 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 on privilege jail. So you've got some docs here. Let's see. Do IRC hacking. Do you know where the big blue bowl is? I have Someone seen might want to mute Dave. Yeah. Dave, I'm going to mute you. You are awesome. Uh, but I'm going to mute Miles will be asking mute, for it mute, to make. Mute, 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 mute. Okay, cool. Uh, ooh, it's in the desired jail features. Oh, that is, I that hasn't received uh, love in a while. That and this belongs at the top of the dock in some way. Boom has notes in 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 the. the Desired feature doc. Okay. Boom. That, and I'll punch this to the top. Bear with me. Note uh, the desired features doc. Great. Uh, Yes, and I even found where I was. Okay, moving on. So unprivileged jail. It sounds like you have a 
a firm requirement, and we will take that at the correct pace. Okay, a few folks, uh, there was some, actually out of uh, Ottawa, there was progress on NSH Portable, which is NSH, a, a Cisco Viata Microtech-like shell for open BSD, and someone actually demonstrated it on FreeBSD Mac OS and others. So uh, if anyone here cares, I'll put you in touch with the right people. If not- I do have to like. point out that- yes. I showed it to a friend of mine on OpenBSD. Oh, he tell. looked at me and he said, when are you going to make the Winbox version of this? I'm like, what? He's like, I do not give a shit about the CLI. I want the Winbox version of this. Okay. <laughs> Goodness, is that Jan? I have never heard that. That's impressive. Okay. Yeah, that's just uh, <laughs> making fun of people. Um, I know, in but funny. OpenBSD way. I, I I mean that's what people want. They want clicky clicky. They he's like very cool, bro. But he's like if if I'm gonna use the NSH version, I could just learn the RC.conf version. Yeah, right. You know, for it, me it's the same. Not hassle. wrong. Not wrong. <laughs> so that that was their response. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes labs. I feel. I feel like we're living I in our own bubble sometimes. I would say set of users who are familiar with switch and router CLIs, but not with Unix system administration. And they are the target audience so that you can give someone an open BSD box if they're used to tinkering with different network operating systems. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I talked to Chris, the NSH guy, and he's like, oh my gosh, router OS syntax is terrible. It needs NSH. Maybe they'll pay us. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're pretty <laughs> set in their ways. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Before router... you switch to the next uh, next topic, just a quick uh, rewind. Yes, sir. Uh, I just opened uh, uh, an OpenSense box I received. So it's running 14.1 late. P2, so I think it's the latest, and yep. it's definitely light HTTPD is on route, not um, so doesn't look like they have fixed the. No, that was for the previous question. I see it. Um, I'm, I'm also on it. Open sense. So it doesn't seem they have fixed it. Interesting. What was? Uh, so Matthias running just received a new Open Sense box, and PHP appears to be running as root, if he's not mistaken. Wow. Yeah. And that's not. Animal. I mean, the only the only thing that's not running as root is DHCP and Unbound. So that leaves you a, a huge list of everything else running as root. I wonder Perfect. what was science, man. PFSense work. running that for regulatory reasons they needed to switch to open sets because of the root thing. That would be very interesting to know. I'll ask the customer. This is very, you know, inner parts of. Open sense at this point, yeah. Oh, and of course, uh, TrueNet still only has recently introduced an admin user after decades, decades, decades. Anyway, um, router board hardware was different every six months at one point, although they finally slowed down and seemed to have a fixed set of boards and such. Many, many people would love to see other OSs on it. I'll leave it at that. I've talked to John himself and tried to license a PowerPC design to do that. Um, if anyone cares, great. Oh. Well, I would say that the most common ones uh, is this either ARM64 for the interesting things. And yep. then um, the real problem isn't just getting the bots. They're not no longer switching a chip every two months, but the problem is to make them interesting, you have to have support for all the chipset offloading features like encryption, uh, layer two forwarding, all the better chips, layer three forwarding, potentially even stateful forwarding uh, with state inspection in the ASIC to offload the CPU. And if you just boot, can say, okay, FreeBSD boots to multi-user. Um, if you put the bootloader on the North Flash or non-Flash, whatever they have, and 
put the operating system proper on a USB device because the internal flash is just a few megabytes, then you've succeeded in booting to multi-user. Great. Yeah. Um, Ooh, you also had making some super it a harsh useful words about uh, Apple Silicon. piece Silicon. of infrastructure is a few steps away from that, and yeah. it's very real uh, workers. Just, it, it, I have a, any form of Ethernet, a block storage device, um, and a console, uh, the CPU and interrupt controller works. That's the first step of porting. Without the first, there is no second, but okay. Uh, I We all could uh, give TPM emulation a test. Thank you, Hans. I guess he joined the last call. Did he provide any updates? I was tied up in the summit, Antoneg. Not to my knowledge, sir. Cool. Um, if anyone has a budget to help him out further, that would be great. I have overextended like mad with the events, such as life. Oh, boy. Um, oh, I have a note relating to this. A company was doing perhaps something like back off on GPU pass through. I think I have the note here, and I'm glad I reminded myself of that. Um, I have tried to get Corvin's GPU pass through work to work several times, and wow, it's been frustrating. Uh, yet I still really, really want that to work. I have a use case, so if anyone's gotten it to magically work, I know Philip, you were either pounding your head against that or offering to, and we just never got to it in Ottawa. But back off. Uh, QL research, oh, that's axiom. Back off. QL research, IBSD maybe? Um, if someone's willing to do a quick search, QL, QL research, ABSD. That is my scribbly notes from my famous little notepad from an event. So uh, investigate. Uh, what they're doing, I do not know, but hopefully that will work in our lifetimes. And while your average desktop isn't AMD server grade CPU based, the uh, the improved AMD IOMU is landing in FreeBSD. Thank you, Kibben Company. And if I understand it correctly, the IOMMU is no longer just needed for virtualization, but also uh, to isolate the devices and to even support enough devices at all if you have a big enough uh, system and enough NVMe drives because Correct. you're running out of um, non-MSIX uh, interrupts. Uh, I've done that on a system with 24 NVMe drives, and we had yep. to unload the VMM kernel driver to, I guess, use its whatever the host OS VMM or IOMMU goodies, and it worked. So uh, that's a very great explanation. I appreciate. Uh, no. uh, just the uh, hardware resources in the interrupt controller, which then you're running out out of bits in the original specification. And so you have to have either multiple of them or the newer thingy and to make devices think that they got one of the normal ones, yep. um, you have to remap them okay, to, so that you can have enough devices that have this type of resource. Cool. That puts a few things in perspective. Appreciate it. Uh, Jan, while you're talking, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, census log t some time ago, oh. which pe perhaps OpenBSD had a better one. This was, one. This? yes. I brought this up because we were affected by the OpenSSHD regression, uh, where there was a bug ages ago. It was fixed. Uh, then um, someone changed the code and introduced a regression, which is not ex a regression on OpenBSD. Because uh -huh. in OpenBSD, they have census log as a system call. Uh -huh. uh, so it's safe to do call census log and thereby syslog from inside a in, uh, signal handler. But okay. on other operating systems, census log <laughs> is not a simple system call. So even writing a static string to uh, syslog is not um, 
async interrupt safe, so you can't use it from inside a signal handler. Is it fixed? Um, the regression is fixed. Again, okay. waiting for the next time someone forgets that you can't have logging in this context. Got it. Um, which is understandable that an open BSD developer says, why well, it works. I know that this yeah. is safe because the main page says it's so. It's just hmm. that, yeah, now the guys doing reporting have to think that they cannot trust the open BSD main page to tell them what they're allowed to call um, on other operating systems in this hmm. context. And that's the reason we don't have it. And the other problem is that our, the way our um, census lock does not exist is also a problem for capsicum and um, for jails because um, the issue is that the syslog server circuit is just bound into your file system. And you, if you either lock yourself using capsicum out of the ability to connect to that and don't have the helper process to forward the locks to, um, or uh, you're inside a jail or change root environment, which does not include its own logging socket, you cannot re-establish your uh, syslog connection. So if someone restarts, the really annoying and treacherous part of that is that it looks like it's working as long as you implicitly log before you enter that uh, jail change root uh, yeah. capsicum, because then you have already created the socket and connected it, even if it is a datagram socket, and then you can keep using it, but when someone on the host restarts syslog D, suddenly your logs stop and are just discarded and no warning, no nothing. You just lose the logs from that point on until you restart the processes. And yeah. Alrighty then. Is there anyone also, else who's um, seen this if, is burned by this and concerned by this? Go ahead. And if yeah. you have a dedicated system call for it, the other nice thing is that that system call can be used to... Uh, in which the messages coming through uh, the socket with ancillary data so that uh, um, um, a syslog D, which is aware of this, could then use ancillary data on the syslog socket to get things like, oh, I don't know, the jail ID, uh, the process ID, and so on. Of all, And you could just give have the kernel give that uh, syslog D that information so that it becomes easier to write reliable, or actually even uh, it becomes possible to write a reliable uh, syslog configuration as in prevent spoofing. And yeah. Okay, to me that sure sounds like a discussion we had at length at the Open ZFS Summit about audited Open ZFS. That's its no. own big fat topic, but- um... It's only- uh, Related if you decide to use that infrastructure. Yeah. Cool. Does anyone else uh, care about this? I had not known I mean, that if you restart the host, you might lose logging on the jail. If you restart syslog D. Yeah. So right, right now, there. with the default FreeBSD syslog D, if you want to change your configuration, you have to restart. Okay. And if you have something like Ansible Automate that, uh, suddenly uh, you run a Ansible playbook and it breaks the logging. Or if you supervise syslogd with something like, I don't know, FSCD to restart failed services, uh, yeah, you restarted your syslog service when it was care, killed yeah. for whatever reason, but uh, you did not allow processes to, uh, which don't have access to the lock so gig socket path uh, to reestablish a connection to it. They will try with every lock messages and they will always fail hmm. uh, by design. Is, is that an Just... infosexual question? It can be, but it's not a novel exploit. It's just a hopefully well understood uh, limitation. Okay, is there anyone else who has this on their radar? Like, oh, or you hadn't encountered that behavior? Uh, 
And we have an owner of one so far. Uh, this can wait, but uh, I coordinated a lovely three-way, four-way discussion during the Open ZFS Summit with uh, Rob Norris, Olivier Sertner, and Jan about all things overlaying ZFS and UnionFS. So I'm so glad you got to talk, Jan. Thank you for participating. Uh, I think Alan has some stuff in motion that Rob looked at, and yay. And and uh, mm -hmm. Olivier gave a great overview of his uh, his status of his work. He came off as a brilliant professor, but that was because he had been extremely tired from a week of family and hadn't spoken English in a week. So it worked out great. I'm so happy for him. Um, yes, Antony, what you got? Uh, since we're in the production section and talking about, you know, it's not ordered, and stuff, ordered yet, but it is. Stuff like that. There was a very nice feature that Moridium, which is a, a payment oh, company yes. from Italy, Mor Moridium, Moridium? Uh, or Mor Netherlands. They, or they, yeah, yeah, they, they sponsor Canada. a lot of the events. Yes. Uh, they, they had a feature request a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if it's done. I don't know if it's easy, but uh, it's actually very much required in, in compliant places. For example, the hospital that we're working on right yeah. now which is logging. So we have an amazing audit framework called Audit D. It's part of OpenBSM, which was yep. very similar, or maybe it's exact one. Jan, you might know the history of the Solaris one that, that was used at... It's um, portable. Is it not in Solaris and even macOS? Go ahead. It, it it was in macOS. Apple removed it in the new one in, in 15, but it's still oh. in 14. Okay. Uh, but as far as I can tell, Apple is either they're hiding it or they're adding... A layer on top. I'm not sure what's happening in Apple land, but I'll ask. Good um, but overall, uh, that feature that feature had a FreeBSD specific thing missing, which is also printing the jail IDs or the jail names rather, not just the jail IDs, right? So the idea is uh, a process has executed something in a location uh, with these environment variables, with these uh, commands, uh, flags, blah, 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 UID, GID, everything. Everything is logged except the jail information. So like which jail was that? A name or an ID, please, right? I don't know if that feature is there is if it has been added in the last five years, but if it hasn't, it would be a killer feature for compliance, especially in places like hospital or any other regulated places. And honestly, it, it would be a killer feature. I don't think it would be hard to what add What do you that. want other than the jail ID? The jail name, because the ID can change, but the name can be very much static. It's like, oh, this has been executed in a jail name to MON0, right? Mon0 okay. instead of... Yeah. But I don't know. I don't even know if it even logs the jail ID even. Right. So like historically there were no jail information. I don't know what the situation is oh, right now. Your own. Yeah. So one, one, of the proposes, mm -hmm. Sorry. one of the limitations why uh, open BSM is not the immediate solution to the open ZFS auditing is that it or NFS auditing is that it works on the um, system call level and stuff like NFS um or ZFS replication commands and so on don't go the normal route when it comes to system calls, but if they go over the network or through a message stream uh, of file system changes. So yeah, that means for local processes, the, uh, the mandatory access control framework works great. And it is jail aware, uh, but the question is, does it populate the records because the schema may not have, it's extensible, but the default schema may not include a FreeBSD specific uh, features. So it could just be that it wouldn't be hard to add, but it is not filled out because macOS, where I think this was originally implemented by Apple on FreeBSD and then ported to macOS because it was easier for them to do that way around. And the problem was that it um, only kept the fields which they expected to have on macOS. <laughs> that's my uh, explanation, but I don't know if that's truly why they decided to do it the way they did it. Um, yeah. So it could be that there's like 
100 lines of C missing somewhere and you ha would have the thing you're asking for, at least JLRDs. I don't know how easy it is to get out the string representation, but given that jail names are host names and so fixed size strings effectively, it shouldn't be too hard if they're not, yeah. As long as they're tied to the J lifetime and not uh, a pointer somewhere you to follow. Cool. Anything else on that? We still have Daniel Bell. No, we do not. So Daniel Bell has a wrapper up his sleeve for FreeBSD update. There is a Rust based FreeBSD Rust date or something. And Ian from that first talk at the summit. Uh, oh, there it is. Metify has a trick. If any of you have tricks for making FreeBSD updates super idiot proof on servers that you auto update, great. If not, we'll just wait for those tools to migrate to package base. <laughs> yeah, isn't the whole point of package base? What a concept. Yes, it is. yes I know. Uh, and oh, see the above points on it that. It would be better to uh, put that effort if. It's out of a limited pool and not out of someone's hobby project because they wanted to do this. Yep. And more power to them, let the get at it. But yep. if it comes out of foundation resources or something or developers um, which okay. are well connected to the Good. project, please, please See put the that effort points. into package space. Excellent. Those <laughs> points are up there. Yay, make it so. Um, uh, uh, People still wonder proper time configuration and G jails having the host up time is like kind of misleading. So there's a whole topic. This is not the time to discuss it, no pun intended, but that's a, a hot one that can never have too little documentation. I can never have too much documentation, I'm trying to say. Okay, uh, punching through and we'll probably just go in kind of survey mode here. Uh, I am talking to Eva about tools to just run dtrace, sample a workload, spit out a file profile, and then have it reproducible. That's classic benchmarking and profiling. Um, but uh, if you've got a co cool tool, great. But I've never seen anyone truly pull it off or have a massive repo of file workloads. It's like, file is designed to have workloads, but there just aren't any to be out there. There are a few in the examples. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, we are far beyond the jail part of this. This list is for all the calls for the rest of the year. So yes. it's a whole lot of things. So if you, if that upsets one, you yeah, I'll wait a few days and yeah. we'll talk on another call. Um this came up at well, the I, summit pre-flight suite for open yes. Go ahead, Jan. Because I have something just a short demo to show, which is jade related. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well then let me touch through these in. just as a teaser inspire. So basically if you have if your name is Perhaps a candidate for one of these, let me know. Um, I have a working, completely opaque SNEA solid state storage performance toolkit installation of like 11 and 12 for FreeBSD that works and then is PHP based. And oh my gosh, I can't make sense of it because the heavy lifting is so hidden behind PHP and other stuff. So <clears throat> uh, back to VMB Hive. Anjanaic, Levi, you and I, let's just get some of, gee, that documentation in there. Uh, he has migrated from uh, from Proxmox. So I put, gee, VM Beehive 0 to 60. How about Proxmox uh, 60 to 0 with Beehive? And he's uh, several people are making those moves. Uh, let's see. Long, broader topic. And even the Enterprise Working Group is looking at this. There is FreeBSD AD integration. Some of it seems to be solved. Antrene, Daniel, let's all look at that and just get some docs out there. Thank you very much. Uh, G, it seems Windows redefines ACPI shutdown behavior at your uh, at will if you know what you're doing. So it took some trickery to tell Windows to like do the right thing when there's an ACPI power button push on Beehive. So it's like, oh, really? So let's get that documented. Oh, IPMI Active Directory, not here, not now. I in picture Doofus, a FreeBSD. Rufus tool that could use a auto on an attend XML to produce a Windows installer. That's my problem, not yours. A few Occam BSD things that's come up a few times over the years. That's kind of my problem, not yours. Oh, good Lord. Why does the current conf 
configuration files in, say, FreeBSD have a mix of spaces and tabs as separators, which really stinks if you try to mechanically process them. It's it that just needs a make conf or make, make conf? in general. Make in general. It's yeah, it's make. Yeah, well, it, but it's like it's just dumb. Uh, like one out of forty is like a space instead of a tab, which isn't for the wrapping. It's not the wrapping. So anyway, I'll, I'll oh. worry about that. It's just dumb. In that case, yeah. On a bus report and ask them to accept that both. Or just make a simple little a git pull request. Anyway, uh, gee, I think with 15, the build option survey image size is yet again too small. Thank you, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Here are a few beehive topics, those can wait. Um Dagnabbit, I should revisit the, the ThinkPad X13S Snapdragon, not to be confused with the X13S thin curl figure. I've got some homework beehive on honeycomb. It's in the garage, got to work, been busy. Uh, Tubster beehive discovered some Windows 11 slowdown. Entrenig, we I touched on this with you and Sergey, the Raspberry Pi 400 and such, courseware, training, you name it. Uh, I should move that up. Uh, someone asked about FreeBSD GPIO. Don't know. That, uh, that was me. That was you. Um, yes. And... I last used it on a real Raspberry Pi 1. It just worked as documented in the main pages. It has nice. a status display for a hack space, basically a read relay in the door. Okay. <laughs> and then a little Nginx status page. And yeah, basically have the space API on that thing and the website would just reverse proxy that request through so that you would always get a live uh, API and PNG representation of the draw status. Uh, Antrenic, what was your use case? Talk to something. Uh, teaching. Um, the problem is that depending on the specific chip, GPIO latency may be good or terrible. Hmm. But it's never as perfect as on a microcontroller. Going from user space to a device driver. Sometimes these things are on I square C proxies or other things on board. Okay. But for simple things like turning on some mains power application or something, the speed is more than good enough, or for measuring stuff. But yeah, remember. It's a GPIO port. If you misconfigure it, you may burn it out. So that's one of the few places in FreeBSD where just an accidental misconfiguration can cause hardware damage. Because if you short circuit an unprotected GPIO pin, that's at the very least your GPIO pin uh, burned out, potentially uh, more if you're unlucky. Oh, good. Magic spell. Um, yeah. Uh, someone made a point that, gee, you can get somewhere with CUDA using the Linux libraries. And this was like last week at the summit. So I'm not a CUDA guy. I'm not an NVIDIA guy. If uh, someone wants to investigate and document, fantastic. Um, There is apparently nested virtualization on both MTube CPUs, but not exposed by the OS, but on M3 and later, supposedly there's that. And of course, as Antrenig, you pointed out, a fanless MacBook Air with Apple Silicon, it makes a kick-ass build server for FreeBSD, ironically. So that's all worth documentation. And a colleague just pointed out that VirtualBox has made progress on Apple Silicon. There you have it. Uh, and uh, it, it's apparently it's M2 now, because in my house is all M1, and yeah. I couldn't get it to... Right. And I think you need, was it, is Mac OS 15 the latest? I think uh, you can do M2 with 15 is not supported, but M3 is, or some goofiness where the CPU has a feature, but the OS doesn't, some things <laughs> like that. Yay. Thank you. Very, very happily, yes. Uh, gee, there are M3, M4 CPUs, but I don't believe they're supported by anything on Apple Silicon. Godspeed. Um, my colleague has installed uh, Gen 2 on an m2 macbook air okay yeah uh, oh, or a macbook okay. pro yes i'm not sure and the 
one of the things that they did is they used the Asahi installer, but at the middle of it, they kind of broke out and they installed Gentoo. Right? Exactly, like OpenBSD does. Yes, they say exactly. use the Asahi installer. Exactly. exactly. Right. So they're planning, this is my colleague who is also a teacher at the university. Uh, so they're planning on doing the same process with OpenBSD, try to do something with FreeBSD, and see basically what other open okay. source operating systems work. But the one Gentoo one is working perfectly. To the uh, the, supposedly is good. I don't know what the problem is with M3, M4. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and the joke is that M2 is so fast that on Gen 2, you feel like in a stalling, not compiling. So. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, I, okay, now we might have a t-shirt. The other ones were borderline. That's pretty good. It's so fast. That's, that's great. Gen 2 is in a stalling, not compiling. Damn. Oh, no. Oh, I love it. For okay. anyone using uh, FreeBSD or other proper operating systems with serial console <laughs> support in uh, UTM, mm -hmm. um, I wrote a little helper to um, just uh, find the DDY device for a serial console so that you can then attach PicoCom to it uh, because ah, yes. no, it's not easily exposed. But with that, I can just say UTM attach in the virtual machine by name or UUID and if it no. exists, it uh, spins it up if it's not already running and then attaches a, um, a com command, uh, normally pico com in the script, uh, to um, your um, VM so that you do, can do things like install FreeBSD over the system console mm. without ever having to use the um, video console. And that's it? And you posted it before I even had a chance to nag you about posting a link? Yes. Brilliant. Good work. Ah, beautiful. Okay, it's there, linked. Boom, thank you. Uh, I saw somebody select here. Gee, scalability is something that anyone can do, and you actually have to dumb yourself down for some of it. Like, why would someone want to generate 10... Uh, 10,000 tap devices and well, find where that limit is. It will tip over at some point because something is limited somewhere. There are countless opportunities for everyone to hop in and a you will find weird it, stuff. <laughs> Go ahead, Jan. A lot of times, especially when you create thousands of network interfaces, it will not tip over and stop working. It will just be that normal commands become annoyingly slow. Correct. Even yeah. when they're not emitting a lot of output because a bunch of that basic control plane stuff is still walking linked lists. Um, because those are assumed to be short and seldom uh, looped over. Yeah, that, that kind and of thing. Those, like... When you violate one of those two assumptions, it's, it becomes a problem. Yep. And gee, the, so some of these subsystems were you know developed in the 80s. They just yep. didn't expect dozens of and, cpu cores etc cetera, etc cetera. so go ahead no, that's anyway. not really the issue here. it's just that the the data structure is used in multiple places so if you change it it um breaks the existing code and it becomes invasive and then you have all the compatibility issues of course you can change your kernel internal api but if you break the ABI in the kernel, kernel module stop working, mm -hmm. and people start yelling at you if you're not on the oldest release in the major release eventually, stuff like this. Cool. So yeah, with 15 upcoming, that would be a moment where you could introduce such breakage without anyone really caring because you're crossing a major release line. Good point. Next time it's 16, if you want to fix that. Yeah. So anyone oh, wanting to fix point. this should hurry up. Um, okay, great point. And right there. Yeah, the other problem is that basically it has to be intrusively linked. You can't use really scalable high fan out data structures because then you can't modify them without sleeping for memory allocation in corner cases. Hmm. If you have an external linkage, so yeah, you're probably limited more or less by the existing code design to use uh, binary trees and not something even faster, like, I don't know, um, 
adaptive radix tries or b trees or something because this um, require you to allocate new pages in the case of b trees or different node sizes in the case of an adaptive radix tree mm -hmm. to insert uh, or in if you have to allocate and you can't easily pre-allocate for a worst case. Cool. Uh, I have something funny to share. I was looking for this. Uh, QL, my note said QL research and IBSD, and I got irritable bowel syndrome results. Anyway, uh, so if this is a good time on 15, FreeBSD 15, to look at opportunities to uh, fix those things, step one is vocalizing. Thank you very much, and you've started that process. Moving on, lightning round um, from the OpenZFS Summit. What do sane defaults look like in uh, 2024? Like, can we assume LZID for compression, Fletcher for checksums, or some notion of checksum equals auto? Should send parameters include certain parameters that everyone uses such that the defaults are ready to change? Um, I won't go too deep into OpenZFS, but Gee, that hope, yeah, that that's not a topic we'll address here. The implicit data set and its confusion that it's caused for years, and things like, gee, we delegated a user to just delete snapshots. Great, but they can delete data sets. No, we didn't mean that. So that should be more fine grained, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I touched on it earlier. This whole notion of like audited ZFS and all things logging and auditing, you name it. Well, I won't even go there. Ba, 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 ton of open ZFS notes I crammed in there. So those can wait. Uh, I got some feedback from Alan Summers on the NFS auditing project. It does need some love. The student was a bit frustrated. He was a bit frustrated. Everyone's a bit frustrated, but there was progress there. That's a placeholder. Sorry about that. I even touched on some of these presentation goodies. AV is definitely off topic here, but it's been a hot topic. So... Does anyone have some topics for the list right off the top of your head? Or shall we call it good, get Jan's quick screen share demo and move on with our lives? You awesome dirty dozen you. Your idea here, but hopefully by at this point you you see the the nature of these little things that have been building up. And some are ridiculously simple. Some are like, oh, let's change everything. I get it. I get it. But let's just knock as many of these can we can off the list, especially for things like FreeBSD 15, especially if there are, you know, line in the sand issues like ABI changes. Any questions at this point? I hope you enjoyed this, given that nearly a dozen of you stuck around for it. I guess you found it funny. I don't know. Entertaining, whatever. Moving on. There's the link. Uh, Jan, you want to show something? What is that you want to show? <clears throat> what Just the current state of what's working. Uh, show of hands or grunts. Who would like to see that? Shall we found it informative? Thank you, Beachy. Uh, is it quick? Can be, unless there are questions. <laughs> uh, sorry, I tried to mute. Okay, uh, sure. I'll stop sharing. Let her rip. Let's run through it. Go for it. Let it rip. Let it rip, and I'll put in the next. Can you see my screen? Is it a reasonable resolution uh, bigger for you guys? Would be nice if you can. You asked, I answered. Yep. There we go. Oh yeah. So, what you got? Um, let's start with from the jail.com for anyone who hasn't seen my crazy stuff before. So, thanks for, uh, to Jamie adding includes in. We can now have a global jail conf, so you don't have to specify a, a jail conf per jail or have a single file anymore since 40. Okay. And so basically, I'm looking for the global ETC and then for this directory. Inside this, here I just define basically system wide defaults, like the pool name and so on, or my domain. And And inside this directory, I have a single file named something.conf. And if we look at that file, yep. 
it is a swim link and the target is executable. I have a little patch applied to my jail command, uh, which is available for review. That patch makes the jail command um, execute um, executable jail.conf during uh, include processing uh, or even the global one if you do it. And that means that you can now have a command run similar to uh, an autodynamic auto mounter map or the SSH uh, authorized keys command. And that command will output or is required to output um, valid configurations to standard output. And if it dies with any exit code other than zero, that's treated like a syntax error. Um, so now let we can have a look at uh, the resulting configuration. Um, so basically it expands into this because it looks into each directory ending in dot D inside this directory and wraps it up into a jail block. And it also sorts the includes using RC order, both for the uh, config file, then it emits an exec clean, and then for each of the exec prepares, it indents them so that it is still easy to read, but more importantly, um, it escapes them and imports them from files ending in .sh. And I'll, not perfect, but um, it also, if there's a reference to a variable, normally it by default quotes that with a backslash. So we will have lots of um, backslashes here. But if it's not um, quoted normally, you can access a variable from jail.conf inside these hooks and the jail.conf parser expands that. But this, which is done by default, is this the unusual case. Normally, you don't want to expand that if you have any non-trivial shell script in there. So that double quoting becomes very error-prone and annoying to do. So instead, what I did is I um, had the desk helper script here use the this command to filter the shell scripts uh, through and basically apply quoting as required by gel.conf, but that would um, prevent you from accessing the variables you've defined in your gel.conf. So here I then look for the escape uh, version of um, three dollar signs uh, and replace it by a single unquoted dollar sign. Yes, there is, in theory, the problem that in shell script it's val valid to expand the uh, dollar variable, so dollar dollar, uh, followed directly by an other variable dereference, or have that inside a quoted string, but that's so unusual that I don't uh, think this is a real world issue if you document it, uh, especially not for prototype. So with this in place, I can now just reference with three dollar signs in my helpers, uh, the jail.conf parameters and jail.conf um, variables. This is how the resulting jail.conf looks. And if I run it, so this jail has here, yeah, let's go into the tiny 14.1p6 directory. Inside of it, I have some links. Mm. So I specify, oh. So uh, I specify the DevFS rules I want for that jail. I specify a helper script, which will um, allocate a static jail ID. And if I now run that, 
uh, with a filter to timestamp each line, just starting from zero seconds and count an ad. Yep, so it dropped. But uh, yeah, I messed around too much. And now I know I've been doing dirty things. Well, get clean, keep it coming. Yep, but let me just. Now it works, I hope, or at least well enough for a demo. I did hack on the code while the call was running. So now uh -huh. it's bootstrapping with package base yep. on the start of the jail. With your nifty ZFS layout and snapshots and yes, clones. Yes, yes. Oh, good. But uh, uh, it's, it sets up the fig jail to then create thin jails from. OK. Uh, how I'm intending to update the thin jail is a topic for tomorrow's call. Uh, because it involves uh, computing the missing commands. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe the, I loop in a ZFS channel program over all the clones, find the ones with the wrong origin, emit it basically the ZFS channel program, then outputs a shell script, which is run by the shell which invoked ZFS, the ZFS channel program. Um, OK, now I have that jail. It took about 50 seconds the first time. Most of that was spent waiting for the package CDN and decompressing the stuff, because it's ZSE decompressed. Um, and if I now stop that jail, bam, it got stopped. And the next time I started, it took like half a second. And if we go over what it does here, um, to help make it more reliable, I unmount anything mounted under the jail root directory so that if there's anything there, I just clean up. This prevents a stuck jail, like we had it before, from um, blocking the jail from restarting. So you don't have to do that manually. Then I found that the jail has already been bootstrapped. So that's a. Then I found that there's a static uh, DevFS root set already allocated for that uh, jail. Um, and that the rule set is already loaded, so no work was needed to uh, flush that rule set and load it anew. Then I mounted all the ZFS file systems because they have been unmounted before. And the next step is to mount the DevFS with the right rule set. And this is required so that you can have a unique uh, rule set for each Beehive uh, jail. And um, it detected that package base was already used by finding a snapshot for that um, patch level. Pre start was empty. Now, this is the jail command itself telling me that the jail has been created. Now, there's nothing in the created. There is nothing in here. Okay, now we're in start, and it just runs through. Um, RC coin. Okay. And now we can do the same for something like this. And that is confusing. I have to check what's happening here. Uh, I think I've broken some of my allocator logic. But let's have a look what I'm doing here. I think I must have uh, corrupted my allocator. Oh. Um, hey, that's not bad for during a call. <laughs> yep, OK. Uh, OK, that's interesting. Uh, but it claims jail here. OK, this is a bug. Uh, there's a mistake here that it it does not with that at some point it writes jail to the variable. That's easy to fix. So, cool. any questions for Jan?
And I've been cleaning up the to-do list as we go and the minutes. Do, 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 do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Happy hacking, Jan. Let's see. Okay, gang. It is six after UTC. I've got that in the docs. I don't know if I need to share the docs. Sure. Why not? Here we go. One last time. I've added some comments there. So Jan, if you want to polish that up to your liking or give links to your nifty ready to go code once you're done, go for it. So any final thoughts, questions, ideas, things for the list? Uh, quick question for Jan. Yes. The this uh, essay, uh, sorry, this. Uh, so this is looking for .sh files, but uh, does it does uh, is the hash bank uh, honored? So you could uh, maybe use some uh, something else than SH. Mm, it runs it as if it's part of your jail.conf. It does what the jail.conf parser does. But you could do it like that. Okay. But I think uh, the jail.conf runs the uh, resulting uh, after it has expanded its variables and parameters, it runs it through sh.c. So it really involves sh-c and then the expanded script is an argument on the argument list. And because of that, you can't have it. But what you can do is you can put your other script, whether you write shell script, which says something like exec, uh, and then the here doc. So you would have a shell script around your normal script. It's not, it's what you have to do in jailconf, uh, or you just have your shell, the shell, shell script exec into a, another command and pass the uh, parameters as uh, arguments. It's a less hacky way of doing it. And it is what you have to do in in jailconf right now. Okay. Great question. The line is mostly to make uh, them auto-detected and so on, to be honest. Cool. Anything else? And because it makes it easy to run the components as their own shell scripts for testing. Who would like the honors? Yes, sir. Antrenik, I see that smile on your face. Go ahead. Thank you. Please like and subscribe in the year 40%, 40, 60, 60, 64% who haven't subscribed yet. Uh, and, and we will all see you next week or tomorrow, depending on when you join us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.